we'll starting with uh, <coughs> number one here. And then you keep in mind that these are the uh, questions that are not like the test. This was the test from last year. Right. So keep that in mind. All right. So the uh, question that they gave us this time is that uh, we have a time frame from 0 to 6. Notice that 0 and 6 are included. And it says the particle is moving along the x-axis. And it says the uh, <coughs> particle's position is not explicitly given. However, we know that the velocity is equal to uh, 2 sine of e to the t over 4 plus 1. And we know the acceleration of the particle also. <coughs> so they uh, nicely gave us the derivative of that, which would be 1 half e to the t over 4 cosine e to the t over 4. And we also know that uh, x of 0 is 2. Okay. So that's all our given information. So we know a velocity equation, we know a uh, acceleration equation, and we also know an initial position here. So bottom line here is that uh, in part A here it says is the speed of the particle increasing or decreasing at time 5.5. And so I guess the question is then, first of all, what you should think of at this point is, what do we know about speed? That's the absolute value of the velocity. Right? So <coughs> with that said, if we, uh, <coughs> and to keep in mind that uh, numbers 1 and 2 are going to be calculated problems, okay? um, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are all non-calculated problems at this point. 2011 was the first year for that. Okay? Uh, before it was 1, 2, and 3 were calculator, 4, four 5, 6, 9. And so we ultimately uh, need to uh, know something about the velocity at that point, 5.5. Um, and so if we have our velocity, we can just go 2 sine of you know, e to the 5.5, they ask. Yeah. And it's plus 1. All right, so that <coughs> right there is our velocity. And the question is, does that tell us enough information to decide what the speed is like? Okay. Well, we, know, we could tell what the speed is. The speed is going to be 0.455, but the, we need to know whether or not the speed is increasing or decreasing at this point. Okay. So really, this is going to be very much like our uh, uh, packet that we did where we did all those I issues where the speed was increasing or decreasing based on the velocity and the acceleration. Okay. And so keep in mind at this point, though, if we were to uh, draw a velocity graph here, we know at this time, 5.5 in question, that the velocity is negative something. True? And if we did the acceleration at that same time, 0.5 times e to the 5.5 divided by 4. And then it's that times the cosine of e to the 5.5 divided by 4. That's it, I guess, right? We would get negative something. <coughs> now, keep in mind, what does that tell us? Well, we know that if the velocity is negative okay, and the acceleration is negative, we know value-wise this would be our picture of our velocity. Okay, not only is it below the x-axis, but it's also decreasing at that point. Okay, our curve would have to look something like that then, wouldn't it, for our velocity curve? Okay, if the acceleration is negative, the acceleration is its derivative. True? So if this is a picture of our velocity, then what would the speed look like? The speed would look like this, wouldn't it? True? And so therefore, what could be said about the speed? It's increasing. Right? So the speed is increasing. And ultimately, again, it says give a reason for your answer. Okay, bottom line is we know that if the <coughs> velocity is negative and the acceleration is negative, speed is increasing. That's one of the culminations of that packet that we worked on, that if the velocity and the acceleration have the same sign, then the speed is what? Speed's increasing. If they had the opposite sign, then the speed would be decreasing. Okay. So you can say that yep, you can say that uh, since <coughs> since uh, b of 5.5 and a of 5.5 have the same sign sign <coughs> speed is increasing. Ultimately, uh, this problem, if you had gotten it right, would have been worth two points. Okay. So two points here. Uh, one for your answer, which is the increasing part, okay. and then also for your reason. Uh, could you show a diagram here like this? Okay. You know, I would. Okay. I'd probably draw a diagram myself and show what I got going on. 
Um, but you also, again, if it says give a reason for your answer, don't just draw a diagram and expect them to know what you're doing. Okay. So I mean, you can tell from here, what did we show? That if the velocity is negative and decreasing, then the speed is increasing. Since it's the absolute value, you can say something like that too. Okay. And uh, one thing that I would be careful with too, especially if you're getting reasons in your writing, okay, don't write too much. Okay. Don't have the right answer and then put a bunch of other garbage with it and have it go wrong. Make sense? Okay. Clear, concise, mathematical. Got it? Make sure it makes calculus sense. Talk about it in a calculus manner. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Part, uh, part B here says find the average velocity of the particle over the uh, time period 0 to 6. And ultimately, uh, for part B here, if we want the average, vo average velocity, we're actually asking for the average value of velocity. Okay? And so therefore, we can go from <coughs> 1 over 6 minus 0, 0 to 6 of the velocity equation. Okay? That right there is going to be our answer. Okay? The average velocity, the average value of the velocity function. And for this problem, since it's a calculator problem, how much time are we going to spend on finding antiderivatives? Yeah, none. Okay. So ultimately, we know that uh, it's just going to be our math 9. And our velocity function is uh, 2 sine dz x over 4. And from 0 to 6. And remember that right there is not the answer because that's just the area part. You're going to multiply that by 1 sixth or divide it by 6. Um, actually, wait a minute. Oh, I forgot my plus 1 on there. I said something wasn't right. <coughs> Try that again. We need a plus 1 on the end of this here. So flip sign of that stuff and then insert a plus 1. And now we'll divide that by 6. And there we go. 1.949. And remember, this is worth two points. One for the integral, one for the answer. Okay. So one for showing the integral, one for giving the correct answer here. And how many points out of two are you going to get here if you put 1.95 for your answer? How many points out of two? One. You get the integral point, but not the answer point. Okay. Everything needs to be rounded to the third decimal place like we've been doing all year. Questions on part B. Okay, part C uh, asks for the total distance traveled. Well, we know the total distance traveled is just from 0 to 6 of the absolute value of the velocity function. You know, in the scheme of things, you know, so far these are pretty easy problems, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Since we've done these kind of problems a million times at this point. Okay. So, and again, especially since it's a calculator problem, that's all we need is just to have that. And the answer, if you type that in correctly, should be 12.573. One point for the integral, one point for the answer. So. <clears throat> All right, and then finally in part D, they ask us for uh, between time zero and time six. Particle changes direction exactly once. Find the uh, position of the particle at that time. And ultimately, we know that uh, when we change position, or uh, when we change direction, that is, then ultimately what equals zero at that time when we change direction? So what equals zero when we change direction? Yeah. Yeah, the velocity. So we need to find that particular time first. So if we uh, see if we can uh, type that in there correctly, we got uh, two, what is it again, sine? Yeah, it's e to the x over 4. one. And again, our time frame here, we're going 0 to 6. Just looking for our, uh, x-intercepts here, so negative 3 to 3 with my window. And if we graph it, here comes our velocity. There's our uh, point in question that we have a change in direction. Because again, the velocity is positive here. The velocity is negative here. Okay. So that time in question, we will spend 0 time using algebra to find it. Okay. Just use our 0 command time we get. And again, here's a good example of if you just looked at that and said, oh, it's 3. Not. Right? Okay. Looks like it's 3, but is it 3? No. Okay. <coughs> Could be 3, but it's not in this case. 3.046 be our answer. 
And if we're going to use that in any capacity, I would certainly use every decimal place available. Okay? Because we know that's not the final answer. That's going to be the time in question. Okay? Um, <coughs> actually, type that in wrong again. Sign e to x over four. You're right. There needs to be another parentheses. There we go. So if we type it in correctly, we won't get that number. We'll get something else. Be that point should be five point something. Five point one nine five five two two three. All right, so that's going to be where we have our change going from again. Velocity changing from positive to negative. All right, and ultimately again we wanted to know the uh, position of the particle at that time. Okay, so we're looking for the position of the particle now. Keep in mind that we don't know an equation for position here, so we can't just find we can't just do our position function and plug that into it. Okay, but what we do know though is that we know that x of zero equals two. So at time zero, we were at position two. Okay. And ultimately, if I knew my displacement from time zero to time this, okay, then I could add that to my two, and I would get the right answer, wouldn't I? Right. So we know that we're at two right now. And if we do our displacement from zero to 5.1955223 of our v function, dt, that right there would do it, wouldn't it? Remember, this gives me displacement which is ultimately my change in position. Okay. If I take two, my initial position, and I add the change in position, that will give me the final position at that particular time. So <coughs> with that, we can uh, type that in and uh, should get, uh, for time's sake, I'll just tell you what you should get. If you do it correctly, it should be 14.135. All right, and again, point breakdown, everything that you do here is worth points. So even if you don't know how to, even if you can't get the final answer to something, you know, at least if you just found where the velocity equals zero, if you knew that's where it occurs, you got one point for just doing that much. Okay? If you wrote the integral correctly, you got <coughs> another point. So if you knew that displacement was the area under the curve from zero to that point that you found, that was worth a point. And then if you took that and added two to it and got the final answer, that was the third point. Questions on anything, point breakdown, procedures? Okay, <coughs> well, we'll move on to uh, number two then. So number two, we have a <coughs> table here that has different temperatures after a certain amount of minutes. And it tells us as a, as a pot of tea cools, the temperature is modeled by the differential equation, uh, or a differentiable function, that is. H for time 0 to time 10. T is measured in minutes. H is measured in degrees Celsius. And we have uh, uh, <coughs> some points in the table, as it says. And part A says use the data in the table to approximate the rate at which the temperature of the tea is changing at time 3.5. All right. So the rate at which the temperature is changing would ultimately be the slope of this h function, wouldn't it? Okay. And if we want at time 3.5, then we just want to pick the surrounding points, like for instance 260 and 552. Okay. So the rate of change of this h function, and again, is just the slope of the h function. So if we did 52 minus 60 and then 5 minus 2, we'd get negative 8 on top, 3 on the bottom. So we get uh, <coughs> negative 8 thirds. And the units on here, and it says uh, show the computations. We showed our slope calculation. Um, and ultimately, they actually they don't ask us for units here. You can put them on there if you want to. Ultimately, be uh, <coughs> degrees Celsius per minutes. Yep, degrees Celsius per minute. Yeah. We put the wrong one, maybe. <laughs> I guess if it doesn't ask for it, you don't have to, but I'd get in the habit of just putting it on there anyway so you don't forget if it does ask you. Okay. Uh, ultimately, it's only worth one point if you got the negative eight thirds here. <coughs> All right, <coughs> and then in uh, part B. What's the 2.6 and 5.5? 2.60 and 5.52. Oh. 
two points in question. The two points that surround 3.5. All right, part B says uh, using correct units, uh, <coughs> tell what, uh, what this is essentially. Well, as soon as we see a 1 over 10, 0 to 10 of an integral, it's automatically, it's a what? It's an average value. And it's the average value of what? Of the h function. Okay. So ultimately, it's just the average. And what does h represent? It's the average temperature. T over time zero to time ten. Okay. Measured in what? <coughs> Keep in mind that the integral here would give us degrees Celsius times minutes, but then we're going to divide it by minutes, which is going to give us just what? Any integral is going to give us the units on the x and y axis multiplied. So right now the h function is degrees Celsius versus minutes. So that means this integral would be Celsius minutes. And if we divide that by minutes, we're going to get back to just what? Celsius. Just Celsius. So ultimately it would be the average temperature measured in degrees Celsius over 10 minutes. And in the uh, <coughs> other part here it says uh, use the trapezoidal rule at four subintervals to, to estimate the answer to this. So with the uh, numbers that we're given, we can see that it's not a uniform subinterval. So therefore, we're going to have to take each trapezoid separately. And if we calculate, we're going to have one half. And the first trapezoid goes from 0 to 2 in the x direction. The two heights are going to be the 66 and the 60. The second trapezoid goes from 2 to 5 in the x direction. So that's going to be a height of 3. The two heights are going to, or the two bases are going to be 60 and 52. And then the next one is going to be from 5 to 9, that's 4. The two heights are going to be 52 and 44. And the last one goes from 9 to 10, which of course is 1. And our heights are 44 and 43. And if we <coughs> add those all together, so again, keep in mind it's a calculator problem. And if we add that all together, and keep in mind we're going to do that. We're going to add these together and get a sum. And then we're going to take that sum and we're going to multiply it by 1 tenth because we're finding the average value. And if we do those together, and again, for time's sake, I'm not going to type that all in, but bottom line is we should get 52.95. And again, they didn't ask for it, but it should be measured in degrees Celsius, as we indicated earlier. Okay. And ultimately, that would be our average temperature. And keeping in mind that uh, looking at the table here, 52.95, and the temperature is going 66, 60, 52, 44, 43, 52.95 seem reasonable at least. Somewhere in the middle of those numbers. All right, so point breakdown, if you got that right here, we uh, the average temperature is worth the point. If you answered that correctly, the explanation. If you uh, set up your trapezoidal sum okay, correctly, you got a point. And then if you multiplied it by one-tenth and got the right answer, that was the third point. Question. All right, then on part C, it says uh, evaluate 0 to 10 of H prime of T dt. And then using correct units, so what does it mean? Well, they didn't give us an H prime here, so how in the world are we going to find an antiderivative for H prime if they didn't give us the formula? What is the antiderivative of H prime? It's H. So ultimately, wouldn't it be H of 10 minus H of 0? And looking at our table, what is h of 10? It's 43 minus h of 0 is 66. We'd get negative 23. Okay. <clears throat> and ultimately, again, just from a common sense standpoint, what are we finding here? This is the temperature at 10, and this is the temperature at 0. This is, the, this is simply the what? It's a change in temperature. Okay. Okay. So, and again, the units here would be 23, negative 23 degrees Celsius. This is the change in temperature. Times zero to time ten. So again, our H ten minus H zero is ultimately just the change in temperature from time zero to time ten. Okay, question. 
question so far? Um, let me see. Yes. Uh, two points here, one for the value. So if you got your negative 23, and then <clears throat> one for the mean. All right. <clears throat> well, let's see what we can do here with part uh, D. We got uh, in part D. They give us uh, some uh, biscuits this time that are cooling instead of the tea. All right. And it tells us that the uh, time zero, the biscuits are 100 degrees Celsius, taken out of the oven. Temperature of the biscuits at, the ti at time t is modeled, modeled by this uh, uh, differentiable function b. We know that b prime of t, though, is negative uh, 13.84 e to the negative 0.173 t. And it says uh, using the given models at time b, how much cooler are the biscuits than the t? Okay. So again, how much cooler are the biscuits than the t? So remember, uh, ultimately, just like we did in the previous problem, what's this going to give us? If we go 0 to 10, okay, that's just going to give us the change in biscuit temperature instead of the change in t temperature, isn't it? So let's calculate then. If we go 0 to 10 of our b function, or b prime function, that is, that they gave us. Then, I guess I didn't need to write it again, but bottom line here is if we go our uh, math 9 and our negative 13.84 e to the negative 0.173x comma x comma 0 comma 10, we're going to get that. Now remember that right there is the change in temperature, right? And again, the ultimate question here is how much cooler are the biscuits than the tea? Or how much, yeah, how much cooler are the biscuits than the tea? Well, how cool are the biscuits now? What did they start out at? 100. Start out at 100. So really, we could go 100 plus the change in temperature. And so that being said, we'd have 100 minus that. And so if we go plus 100 to that, we'd get 34.182728 uh, would be the temperature of the biscuits. And what's the temperature of the T at time 10? And we're comparing that to 43. So if we uh, <coughs> subtract 43 from that, we're going to get uh, 8.817 degrees Celsius. Would be how much cooler the biscuits are than the T. Now keep in mind that one thing you have to be careful with when you actually answer the question. Okay, <coughs> You don't want to say something like the biscuits are negative 8.817 cooler. Ultimately, you know, this should be a positive quantity that you get because we're just saying in the sentence they're 8.817 cooler. Okay? The cooler part gives us the direction. We don't want to say it's negative 8 cooler. Okay? We're going to say it's 8 cooler. All right, so if you uh, integrated properly, one point. If you uh, added 100 to it to get the final temperature, which is that one, you get a point. And if you found the difference, the third point. All right, any questions on number three? Part D, I should say. Part D. All right, so far, nothing uh, too crazy, huh? Pretty similar to what we've been doing, huh? OK, let's look at uh, number three, because number three gets really crazy. Very crazy. All right, just got a region problem, and we know what we're probably going to have to do with regions. We've got to either find areas or find volumes of some sort. Okay? So again, very typical to the problems that we've studied already. And in, uh, <coughs> in uh, part A here, they give us uh, first that the uh, region is defined by 8x cubed uh, and sine pi x. As we can see, they intersect at 1 half 1 to give us. And it says, uh, write an equation for the line tangent to the graph of f at 1 half. Well, we know that in general, if we're going to write the equation for a tangent line, we're going to start out writing point slope form down. Okay. We know the point at x equals 1 half 
And so half of our two thirds of our job is essentially done here. We, we need three blanks to fill in here. And we know that the point here is one half one. They essentially gave us all that. So our bottom line is here, we just need to find the slope of f at that point. Well, we know that the slope is going to be found with the derivative. And the derivative here would be 24x squared. And so therefore, if we put our f prime of 1 half in there, we get a quarter times 24, that'd be 6. And so final answer should be that. Absolutely. Unless it tells you to do something otherwise, you leave it in point slope form and call it good. So bottom line is uh, you got one point for finding the derivative, which is uh, really tricky, I know, finding the derivative of that cubic function, right? So I just hope for these kind of layups on this year's test, right? And another point, it's actually worth two nice of the problem in that, which is nice. So. All right. <coughs> now we've got to find the area <coughs> next of this uh, region R. And the area of that region, we know, of course, is going to be the top function minus the bottom function's integral on that 0 to 1 half. <coughs> and so if we go to that, we're going to have 8x cubed, or excuse me, the sine function's on top. So it's sine pi x minus 8x cubed dx. And now here's where the issue comes in, is this is a non-calculator problem, so we can't just plug that in the calculator. Okay. So if we're going to find our derivatives here, we know that the deriv the uh, or antiderivatives, that is, we know that sine's antiderivative is going to be <coughs> negative cosine. But we have a chain rule issue here. And remember that uh, if we have something kx here, it's going to be negative 1 over k. So negative 1 over pi cosine pi x would be our antiderivative. And then the antiderivative of x to the third is going to be x to the fourth over 4. So it'd be 2x to the fourth here. And in a non-calculator non -calculator problem, we can generally count on being able to deal with hopefully fairly decent numbers and so on. Right? And <clears throat> so let's see what we get. We put a half in here. We're going to get negative 1 over pi. Cosine of pi over 2 we know is what? Pi over 2? Um, no. That's 0. Oh. Okay. And if we put a half in here, we get uh, 1 half keep, uh, to the fourth power would be 1 16th times 2 would be 1 8th. So we'd have 1 8th in that parentheses minus. If we plug a 0 in here, we know that that part's 0, but we'd have cosine of 0, which we know is 1. And so we get negative 1 over pi here in that parentheses. And so if we uh, simplify it here and add those together, we get negative 1 8 plus 1 over pi. <coughs> so if you uh, set up the integrand correctly, you got a point. So if you set it up as a top minus bottom situation, which again, hopefully is easy points for us at this point. And that's good. If you uh, found both antiderivatives, you got two points for that. And if you found the final answer, you got another point for that. Questions on any part of part B? Okay. Part C says uh, <coughs> write but do not evaluate an integral expression for the volume of a solid generated by rotating R around the horizontal line y equals 1. So <coughs> Ultimately, we're going to have our function you know, looks something like this here. And we're going to rotate it over. And actually, that looks more like this. So we know that sine is going to be 1 at that point, 1 half, 1. And we're going to rotate it around this line, y equals 1. So if we use a vertical slice, which would make sense here in this problem, since we have a top minus bottom situation. Okay, then ultimately what's that going to create if we take that slice and we go around this line? It's going to be a washer. So if we set up our washers, we're going to go 0 to 1 uh, zero to one half again. Pi outside radius squared minus inside radius squared dx. And then our only other issue is being able to write expressions for those outside and inside radius. So remember in the picture here, this right here would be the outside radius. Okay. So I'll call it R, R O, outside radius. So the question is, how far is it from there to there? Well, how far would it be from here to here? This here would be the 8x squared function, wouldn't it? And so how far would this distance be, knowing that the top, val the top value here is 1? 
Wouldn't it be 1 minus 8x squared? Cubed, that is. Okay, so that distance can be represented by, since this right here, since the whole thing is 1 and this part is 8x cubed, then the missing part would be 1 minus 8x cubed. Same thing with the inside radius, which would be that part, r sub i, if you will. Okay, that inside radius is going to be, we know that from here to here is the sine function. So how far would it be from here to here? 1 minus the sine function. So we'd have 1 minus sine pi x here. And that right there would do it. It said write, but do not evaluate. So we're done. Three points for that. And here's how the point breakdown goes. You get one point just for knowing that it's a washer problem and having the not only the, const, the constant of integration, the 1 and the 0 to 1 half, if you had just this part right here, that's worth a point. So even if you mess this part up, you still get one point for having that right, recognizing that's a washer problem. Okay. And then the other part is for the integrand. And they, uh, I'm pretty sure that in a problem like this, and they don't specifically say it in the Ruby rules here, but if you had two parts to the integrand like this and you got one of the parts right out of two, you'd probably get one point out of two, I believe. I don't think you need to get both right to get the two points. It just says integrand two. So I'm assuming since they're both fairly separate from one another that you could get one point for getting half of it right at least. Ultimately, in a problem like that though, at this point for us, really no good reason to not get both points on that. It's hopefully pretty straightforward for us. All right, any questions on the setup on part C? <coughs> All right, <coughs> move on to number four then. And uh, number four, we have a picture of a graph of f given, and we also have a g function described. <coughs> and it tells us that uh, the g function is 2x plus 0 to x of f of t dt. And we ultimately need to find g of negative 3. So if we need to find g of negative 3, well, just like any function, it's a matter of putting negative 3 into our function. So we get 2 times negative 3, and then it'd be the area from 0 to 3 of f of t dt. Negative 3, that is. Okay. All right. Well, first part, hopefully we can get that part right. All right. All right. And then if we look at our area, this uh, function they gave us is made up of two quarter circles and a line segment. And if we go from 0 back to negative 3, that looks like that's just that, uh, that one quarter circle. And that quarter circle has an area of 9 pi. The circle itself does, right? Because it's radius 3. So it would be 9 pi, but it's only a quarter of it, so it would be 9 fourths pi. Now here's the question, though, for this part. If I go from 0 to 3, I'm going backwards, right? And it's above, so that would be treated as negative, so it would be minus 9 pi over 4. One point for getting that correct. If you uh, figured out the negative 6 and the negative 9 pi over 4 part, get one point total. <coughs> then in the uh, second part of part A, they ask us to find g prime of x. Well, we know that g prime, the derivative of g, is going to be 2 plus f of x because we have an integral defined function, and the fundamental theorem tells us that if we take the derivative of an integral defined function, that the answer is the integrand evaluated at the upper limit times the derivative of the upper limit. But in this case, the upper limit is just simply x. The derivative of the upper limit would be 1 then. And so that would be our derivative. Another point for getting that part right. And then they ultimately want the derivative at negative 3. So if we plug a negative 3 in there, we're going to get uh, the following. And from the picture, what do we see of f of negative 3? We have a picture of f. What is the value of f at negative 3? At 0. So therefore, the answer is 2. One point for getting that. All right. Again, very much like all the problems that we've been doing in our packets and our other work. All right. So far. See what happens with our uh, part B then next. It says uh, determine the x-coordinate of the point at which g has an absolute maximum on the interval negative 4 to 3. Okay, and justify your answer. All right, so notice that uh, negative 4 to 3 are included here. So we would need to uh, do the candidate test if we have an included interval. So if I were you, I'd first do the uh, 
endpoints first, get values for the endpoints because we're looking for an absolute maximum on this interval. So if I want g of negative 4, that's going to be 2 times negative 4 plus the area from 0 to negative 4 of f of t dt. Okay. And ultimately that's going to be negative 8. And the area from uh, 0 to 4, we know 0 to negative 3 is already negative, pi over, negative 9 pi over 4. And you notice that the net from 3 to 4, it's just a circle radius 1. So that means it would be pi divided by 4. Okay. And remember, that's negative and going left, so that's going to be treat, treated as positive. So ultimately, it would be negative 8. And again, negative 9 pi over 4 plus 1 pi over 4 would be negative 8 pi over 4. So negative 8 pi over 4 would be negative 2 pi. So, so far, how's that looking for a maximum? Yeah, probably not very good, negative 14 and some change, right? Okay. So still need to check the candidates, though. If we do the same thing for 3, we got uh, the 2 times 3, 0 to 3 of f of t dt. And if we do that, we're going to get 6. And from 0 to 3, we have a line segment that is made up of essentially two triangles, one's above, one's below. And should we take for granted that that's crossing at 1.5? try it. And it might be. And you might get lucky, but I certainly wouldn't. Okay, we know we're going from 0, 3 to 3, negative 3. Okay. It's a pretty uniform line there, though. We can see that uh, we're going down 6 and over 3. The slope is negative 1 half. Okay. So down 1, <coughs> down, or negative 1 half, negative 2, I should say. So we're going down 6 over 3. So slope being negative 2, that means our equation, I'll do that on the side over here, our equation would be y equals negative 2x plus 3. And if we do the <coughs> y-intercept of that, we'd end up with uh, <coughs> 3 halves as our x. So it does, in fact, cross at 1 and a half, as we suspected. Okay. And <coughs> if we do the uh, area, keep in mind that the area of those two triangles is going to be what? They're going to be the same, aren't they? One positive, one negative. So ultimately, we're going to have 6 plus 0, which is what? 6. So that might be the answer. That could be the answer is at, at 3 we have the absolute maximum. That could be. Okay. All right. And the other options, though, are where the derivative equals 0. Okay. And so our derivative, we know, we said earlier, was 2 plus f of x. Right. So ultimately, where does this equal 0? It would be when f of x equals negative 2 then, wouldn't it? So the other candidate is going to be when f of x equals negative 2. And the question is, where does f equal negative 2? Well, if we look at that picture, you know, we could kind of estimate it, but do we need to estimate it? Remember, at that point, isn't this f right here? Okay. You know, it's only on the right-hand side where it's going to hit that negative 2 line, right? So if we set that equal to negative 2, negative 2 equals negative 2x plus 3. We'd have negative 5 equals to negative 2x. And also maybe 5 halves would be our x in question. So 5 halves would be the other candidate. So x equals 5 halves. <clears throat> so again, that would be the only time when the derivative equals 0. Okay. And so if we uh, find g at that point, g of 5 halves, it's going to be 2 times 5 halves plus the area from 0 to 5 halves of f of t dt. And our main goal here is to see if this is bigger than 6, huh? Okay. And I'm running out of space here, but ultimately we'd have 5 plus something. And the something here this time is going to be we're going to add 2, 5. We're going to have that triangle that goes from uh, 0 to 3 halves. That's going to be our positive part, right? So we're going to go 1 half times 3 halves times 3. Because that triangle is going to be 3 halves by 3 dimensions. So it would be 1 half times 3 halves times 3. And then we're going to subtract from that the other triangle, which goes 1 half. It's going from 1 and a half to 2 and a half, remember. So that means it's got a 1 base is 1, and the height is going to be negative 2. Okay. And just straight up height, we'll call it 2. We don't want to subtract a negative here, otherwise we're going to be adding that. So let's see what we get. So this part right here is going to be... 9 fourths, okay. so 5 plus 9 fourths, and <clears throat> this is going to be minus 
1. That triangle, the other triangle is going to be uh, area 1. So 5 plus 9 fourths, that's going to be 7 and a quarter. And 7 and a quarter minus 1 is going to be what? 6 and a quarter. So who wins? Yeah, that one wins. That's the biggest one, isn't it? So let's go back and answer the question as it was defined. It says determine the x coordinate of the point at which g has an absolute maximum. So our final answer here is actually what? Uh, x equals 5 halves. And again, I'm running out of space, but that would be our final answer then. So even though that problem was a little bit time consuming, okay, is it really mechanically wise anything different than what we've been doing? Those are the candidate test problems. Uh, point breakdown for that one, for part B, it was this. If we uh, <coughs> Uh, considered the derivative equaling zero. So if we found the derivative and set it equal to zero, we got a point for that part. Um, <coughs> identifying that candidate, in other words, finding the five halves, the point, and then the answer with justification. Okay. Ultimately, our justification is the candidate test. That work is the justification. So if we got our five halves and we had all that work shown, we'd be good to go. Okay. So anytime we have a closed interval, the candidate test is a viable justification. Okay, we find the only candidates, and we pick the biggest one. Okay, okay questions so far? All right. <clears throat> Carrying on then, part C. So let's find all the values on negative 4 to 3, not including notice, for which the graph of G has a point of inflection. Well, we know that uh, G prime, we said, was 2 plus F of X. And... We know that g double prime then is just f prime of x. And we want to know inflection points. So inflection points are where the second derivative, which in our case is f prime. So first of all, when does f prime equal 0? Okay, so the question is, does f prime equal 0? Looking at your picture, does the derivative of that picture equal 0 ever? Well, it does at negative 4, which we know that's a circle, right? But is negative 4 an option? No. Okay, so anywhere on the interior, does the derivative equal zero? No. So is there anywhere that the derivative does not exist? At x equals zero, we have a corner, don't we? Okay. Now, the bigger issue, though, is that uh, x equals zero being a candidate, okay, does, our, does our derivative of f, does it change from positive to negative or negative to positive? Okay. The derivative of f on the left-hand side is positive. It's increasing to get to zero, isn't it? And then it's decreasing to get... To the right of zero? True? So if it's increasing, remember again, f prime is positive on the left and it's, de it's negative on the right because the slope of f is positive and then the slope of f is negative. So it does change slope. It changes from positive slope to negative slope. slope. So that means the values of g double prime change from positive to negative. And therefore, we could say, yes, we do have an inflection point at x equals zero. So x equals zero is an inflection point. And again, if we had to explain that, we'd say because what? Yeah, we could say because the derivative of f changes from positive to negative. Okay. We could also say, you know, this is ultimately g double prime too. We could say that g double prime changes from positive to negative. Okay, but the reason is because the slope of f changes from positive to negative. Okay. We could also say that <coughs> f changes from increasing to decreasing at that point. Be another way to say it. That would be true. Nope. As long as it makes calculus sense. You can say any of those things. All right. Okay, finally on part D, it says uh, find the average rate of change. And here's where we have to be very careful. Average rate of change and average value are not the same. Average rate of change, one word should come to your mind immediately. It should be what? Slope. slope. Okay. The average rate of change is a slope. So the average rate of change of f on the interval negative 4 to 3. Okay. Again, we're looking for the average rate of change of f here. So that means we need f of negative 3, or negative 4 that is, and f of 3 because we're going to want to calculate the slope between the endpoints ultimately. So we can see that f of negative 4 is negative 1, and f of 3 is negative 3. So that average rate of change would be negative 3 minus negative 1 over 3 minus negative 4, which would be negative, uh, oops, negative 2 on top, 7 on the bottom. So negative 2 sevenths would be our average rate of change. 
Uh, I forgot, by the way, that inflection point problem is worth one point finding that inflection point for the explanation. Uh, one point for finding the average rate of change. So if you were recognize that they, all they wanted is a slope, <coughs> then you could go ahead and put that, uh, find the answer to the slope between those two endpoints. One point for that. And then uh, <coughs> on the second part it says there is, or there is no point C between negative four and three for which the derivative at C equals the average rate of change. So explain why this does not contradict the mean value theorem. What's up with this function that the mean value theorem doesn't apply? It's not differentiable on the interval, is it? Okay. So we can say that f of x is not differentiable on negative 4 or 3. And one more point for that. Okay, questions so far?